stay true to the time allocated to speak on uh, a very elaborate subject per se, whereas putting into the biblical context the theme or the sense of what we've been discussing here, that is uh, the theology of wealth creation and entrepreneurship in poverty eradication. Allow me then to also, just in the interest of clarity and focus, to share with us the three, four core areas I'd like to highlight in us helping us to appreciate the mind of God as revealed in the Holy Scriptures insofar as wealth creation and entrepreneurship is concerned in addressing poverty and education. I'll, I'll address myself to four key areas. I'll look at the excellency factor, what I call the EXQ. Please write EXQ, because you'll appreciate that's very important in wealth creation and entrepreneurship. EXQ is excellency quotient. You know, we have IQ, we have EQ, that is emotional quotient. Now we have which one? Excellency, excellency quotient. We look at the ownership factor, because that again is a clear theological position uh, without getting dogmatic. The ownership factor is addressed very clearly in scriptures. The stewardship factor, and then we'll summarize with the responsibility factor. So what are the three core, four core areas? Number one, ownership. the excellency quotient. Number two, ownership. ownership. Number three, stewardship. stewardship. Number four, responsibility. Let me begin with the excellency so that we put it into perspective. It has been said and I agree that the quality of a person's life is in direct proportion to their level of commitment to excellence. So if you show me your level, I mean the quality of your life, then I'll show you your level of commitment to what? To excellence. So the question is, how are you committed to excellence? And whereas wealth creation and entrepreneurship is concerned, it's important we understand that the scripture is very abundant in affirming that where mediocrity where people are resigned to lower levels of existence and low quality of life and feeling like they can't, they don't deserve well, they don't deserve to achieve great things in their lives, then poverty reigns, especially in our continent, Africa. Allow me to read for us a scripture then, Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 17 on. It says, blessed are you, O land, when your king is a son of nobles, and your princess feast at the proper time. Not the emphasis. The princess feast at the proper time. So when your kings are sons of nobles, your kings are respectable, your kings are people of high repute, then your princess will feast at the proper time. For strength and not for drunkenness. Because of laziness, because of what? Because of laziness, the roof caves in. And because of negligent hands, the house leaks. Because of laziness, the roof caves in. And because of negligent hands, the house leaks. A feast is prepared for laughter. And wine makes life happy. But money answers everything. How many of us know there's a verse that says man, money answers everything? It's there, okay? <laughs> then he says, do not curse a king even in your thoughts. Do not curse a rich person even in your bedroom. <laughs> For a bird of the sky may carry the message. <laughs> I can tell your minds are breathing. That's the word of God. Ecclesiastes 10 verse 17 to 20. What is the point here? The point is, when there is mediocrity in leadership, then there will be poverty. Systems will collapse. Systems of entrepreneurship. In fact, largely in our continent, poverty and lack of wealth creation is not because we are not hardworking. Are you hardworking? But largely, it's because of systems, and even governments, and even mafiaso systems of corruption, 
have made it very impossible that even the modest hardworking person cannot rise. And so it's important we understand then that uh, it's a call, wealth creation is a, call, is a battle between mediocrity and excellence. And after all that you've been told the whole week, you need to ask yourself, will you commit yourself to excellency and rise to the occasion? It says money answers everything. In other words, everything has a price tag. Everything has a value proposition. And so we are not going to just make merry, but we are also going to ask ourselves, what's the VAT? What's the value adding touch? What's excellency quotient then? Excellency quotient, my sisters and my brothers here present, is that desire and that capacity to positively influence progress, productivity, and purpose. That inner desire and capacity to influence three things. Progress, productivity, and purpose. Let's say those three Ps together. Progress, productivity, and purpose. One is an inner desire. When you look at poverty and you feel mad at poverty, the indignity of poverty, I've lived in the three largest slums in the city of Nairobi, and I can tell you poverty is bad. I hate poverty. Hello, how many of you hate poverty here? <laughs> so does God. And you'll see that momentarily. And so, you must have that inner desire. Something in you, the tragedy of our times is that, Michael Angelo said, is that not that people aim high and miss, but that they aim low and hit. Have you had someone saying, I'm not so badly off compared to my younger sister, compared to my neighbors, I'm not so badly off. It's because we compare ourselves to the lowest. So then, I am calling us and I'm inspiring us to commit ourselves to excellence. When we start pursuing to be the best us, be the best you, or better still, can you commit to better your best? Whatever you've been doing, better you are. Please turn to your sister and your brother and tell them better your best. I know your best, now better it. I conclude that part so that I can move to the second part. And I want to say that you will always attract who you are. You can teach what you know, but you'll only attract and produce who you are. If you believe you are wealthy, you'll start attracting wealth. Hello? There are people who believe they are so poor that even if wealth comes to them, they will feel shy. They say, please go. <laughs> I'm not if you're given one million here today, and you say, hallelujah, the Lord has remembered me. It has taken long to come where it belongs. Some of us, if I tell you you are smart, do you say thank you? Or do you say, oh, no, please, don't say that. <laughs> you are very wealthy people. Are you wealthy? Yes. yes. Shake your neighbor's hand and tell them, handle me with care. I'm very wealthy. <laughs> All right. I conclude by saying, Grant Cardon, I'm reading a very interesting book by an author called Grant Cardon. The title is The Ten Times Rule. What's the title? Ten Times Rule. And in that, he proposes that when you think ten times and you act ten times, you'll always be above in your industry. You'll always be above your peers. You'll always be above your society. You'll be above other women. I'm relating it to you. And he says, when you think 10 times, think what people are thinking, and then double or times 10 what they are thinking. If they budget in $1,000, you budget in? 10000 If they have 10, one year's plan, one year business plan you have? Yes. How many of us have 10 years business plan? Or one year? Only 7% of, 9% of adults in the world have written plans. I hope you are amongst us. Now listen to what he says. As, he says when people start limiting the amount of success and desire, when you start limiting the amount of success that you desire, then you also limit the amount of effort required of you. 
if you know that I can't be rich and you give up, mm. then you'll give up on any action that should make you rich. Mm. Does that make sense? Mm. Yes. But when you think big, you'll start acting big. When you want to be big, solve big problems. Mm. Many of us, we are entrepreneurs of small things. Mm. If you're an entrepreneur of big things, then you become a big person. If you are a matatu driver, or matatu is a, we call them taxi in other places, mm -hmm. or you know this motorcycle, mm -hmm. you are also a transport officer. If you are a motorcycle driver, right, you are a transport officer. Yes. But he's also a pilot, he's also a transport officer. Which one would you rather be? <laughs> so what does God say to us so that we get it in the context of, especially in our continent? He says in Isaiah 60 verse 15, that whereas you were forsaken and no one went through you, I will make you an eternal excellency and a joy of many generations. That's God's promise. Sometimes you've been rejected, people assume you, people <coughs> do not recognize you, they do not respect you. He says, though you are rejected and forsaken, I will make you an eternal excellency and a joy of many generations. So let's go to the second thing. First one we just addressed is excellency quotient. The fact that you attract who you are. God wants, you can never produce who you are not. If you see yourself wealthy, and God affirms it, God says you are important, see yourself as that. Because sometimes it's low self-esteem. So the second thing we want to talk about is ownership. The scriptures are replete with illustrations and references about the question of ownership. Why is that important? Our perception of ownership will influence our operations in entrepreneurship. Sorry, let me say it differently. Your perception of who owns the world will influence your operations in entrepreneurship. We are talking about wealth and entrepreneurship. So your perception of who owns that wealth will influence your entrepreneurship. Why so? You read with me Psalm 24, you can quote it right somewhere you refer. It says, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell in it. The earth and everything on it, including its people, belong to the Lord. Is that clear? It's important we understand that because from the scriptures, if we do not address the question of wealth ownership, we will get ourselves confused in wealth creation. Allow me to say at the risk of something contradictory. Essentially, we do not create wealth. The wealth is already created by our Father God. He is the owner. How many of us are going to create wealth here? <coughs> Have I just converted all of you? How many of you create wealth? How many of you God know that God has created the world and he owns it? So I'll tell you what your role is according to the scripture. Because the scriptural position is that God owns everything. And this is why it's important. Moses in Deuteronomy 8, 17 warned the children of Israel lest they go into the promised land with the mindset of we are going to create our own world. He warned them, beware lest you say in your heart, my power and my might, the might of my hand have gotten me my wealth. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the power to get wealth, that you may confirm his covenant that is what to your fathers. That's Deuteronomy 8, verse 17 and 18. So wealth creation for us, with all the perspectives we've got in economical, sociological, political, and all those other serious aspects, must still be seen in the context of the scriptures that God says, even when you get wealth, in fact, does not say, I give you the power to make, I give you the power to get, which means it is somewhere, you go and get it. How many want to get wealth? Oh, oh. Am I helping us? How many of us want to get wealth? God says, I've given you the power to do what? To get it, which means it is there. Suppose I hit something here and I told you, please, there's a bundle of $1,000 hidden in this room. The first person to get it, that will be yours. How many of you will move? Suppose it is true. Can you start looking for it now? 
study. No, it is not true. Which means God has created wealth. The wealth in our continent is so immense. That's why they could not allow Gaddafi to leave. Because Gaddafi wanted to create the Africa Bank, which was going to have its capital based on the wealth of the, of the continent. This continent is very wealthy. How many of you know that is the wealthiest continent hosting the poorest people? <laughs> it's because we have not known how to get it. Did you know not everybody that works in a soap making factory is clean? Because you must take the soap and use it. You can be poor in an environment of wealth. God forbid, that's not your portion. So secondly, he says, look at, now, in the New Testament, Paul warns those who think that wealth is their own, and they are the ones who have made it, he warns those who want to get rich, fall into temptation and are trapped and, and into many foolish and harmful desires that plant people who run, ruin, who, people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. It says, but you, man of God, flee from all these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Because if we do not understand the mind of God about wealth, then we will pursue wealth creation from the wrong perspective. And that will not be fair to us. So let's first appreciate that wealth, it's God who owns it. Look at Jesus' warning in Luke 12. He says, then he said, the, sorry, and he told him this parable, a ground, the ground of a certain rich man yielded a violent harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger, bigger ones. There and there I will store my surplus grain. And I say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take, easy, take life easy. Eat, drink, and marry. But God said to him that night, what did God tell him? You fool. It's not me. It's the scripture. God called somebody who was very wealthy, what? Fool. You fool. This very night, your life will be demanded of you. <laughs> then you will get what you have prepared for yourself. This is how it will be with whosoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich towards God. So the theology of wealth, as far as God is concerned, and entrepreneurship is this, that you understand that God has laid up wealth, there's wealth for you, and even as you're pursuing it, you know that it is him who owns it. If I was in church, I would have said, say amen. amen. I would have said and you said amen. amen. Psalms 112, so we got the third and the second last one. Psalms 112 says this, blessed are those who fear the Lord, who find great delight in his commands, their children would be mighty in the land. How many mothers here want their children to be mighty in the land? Amen. Okay. Blessed are those who fear the Lord and who find great delight in his commands. Their children will be mighty in the, land, in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in their houses and their righteousness endure forever. Psalms 112 verse 1 to 3. How many of you know that Wealth and riches are in your homes. That's the word of God. If you're righteous, that is. If you're wicked, there's a problem. Let's go to reflection three, then we summarize it together. But I want to, as the doctor has said, I want to allow for questions so that it's more practical. Is that fine? Are we together? Amen. If you're together, do like this. If it has gone, do like this. All right. Let's take the second last one. Stewardship factor. So we've looked at excellency, we looked at ownership, and now we've come to stewardship. When now you understand that you are, God has voted for you to be wealthy, you are your excellency. And two, he's telling you there's wealth for you. Go and get it. And he says to you in Deuteronomy 8:18 again, I've given you power. It's like giving you master key. 
He's telling you, you are the owner of the wealth, or you're the person I want to share my wealth with? Okay, here's the master key. Go and get the wealth. But as you're going to get the wealth, it's important to get the third very profound theological concept in the scriptures, which is stewardship. Stewardship basically means taking care of that which belongs to somebody. Is that true? Mm -hmm. Even your children are not yours. Mm -hmm. Even that your husband is not yours. That's scary to imagine. Is that so? Everything you have belongs to God. Okay, let's go count this. Now look at this. When we appreciate who we are, whose we are, and what we have, that is called wealth. Who we are, whose we are, and what we have, that is called wealth. When you appreciate that, because that is what God has provided for you. Then that, that is God's gift to us. Then what we do with who we are and what we have is our gift to God. Who you are and what you have is God's gift to you. That's wealth. What you do with who you are and what you have is your gift to God and society. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. Now that is called entrepreneurship as far as God is concerned. I'll explain it. I know we've gotten some technical definitions earlier. But let me explain to you. Entrepreneurship basically means that you appropriate the wealth for the good of others. You have value adding. You have USP, unique selling proposition. You activate wealth. And I'll show you as you do the last bit how you're supposed to do this as far as the scriptures are concerned. So, who's you, who you are and what you have is God's gift to you. What you do with who you are and what you have is your gift to God. That is wealth plus entrepreneurship. Let me give us scriptures for that. So entrepreneurship is, entrepreneurship is now bringing out value of the wealth that you are and that you have. Let me ask you, suppose you are to better your best. Suppose you are to bring out the full best that you are. Or let me ask it differently. The day you stand before God and he shows you the you that you are supposed to be, that you never became, how will you feel? The late Dr. Miles Munro said, the wealthiest place on earth is the cemetery or the graveyard. You know why? Because there's wealth of good books that were never written that have been deposited there with people's bodies. There are buildings that were supposed to be built. There were invention, innovations that were supposed to be innovated. There were many things that were supposed to be innovative, but somebody was selfish and they were mediocre, they were living small, and they ended up dying with it, and therefore they deposited that wealth to the grave. That is not your portion. After this conference, if this conference with all that the ASCC has invested in you and you invested your time, it's only fair that you go out there and start emptying yourself. Say yes. yes. Okay. So listen, it means working hard. Proverbs 10 verse 4 says, He becomes poor who works with a lazy hand. But the hand of the diligent brings wealth. Look at that. The wealth is there. When your hand is diligent, what does it do? It brings it. So the philosophy of scripture, as far as wealth is concerned, is that you are a good steward when you are diligent when you work hard, and scriptures talk so harsh against laziness and bribery and corruption and shortcuts, but it promotes hard work, diligence, because that is what is called entrepreneurship in the Bible language. Bible language means you are the virtuous woman, Proverbs 31. Is that true? Yes. Did you know the first oil baron recorded in the Bible was a woman? She owned an entire petrol station in her neighborhood. Go and read First Kings chapter 4. This lady, the Shunammite widow, who Elijah told, okay, go and bring, collect all the empty cans and, and drums around the neighborhood, bring them, and then we'll perform a miracle. And all of a sudden, she became a supplier of oil. How many would like to be oil, oil barons? That was entrepreneurship. The question of entrepreneurship is, what do you have, who are you, and what are you doing with what you have and who you are? That's a question of entrepreneurship. 
because you have the wealth. You are the wealth. You know the way we tell our children? Just do your best. God will do the rest. We should change that from today. God did his best. You are the best. You do the rest. Can't you never tell them, God did the best. You are the best. Do the rest. Okay. So, scriptures say, if you are faithful, that is entrepreneurship, if you are faithful in little things, you will be faithful in large ones. If you are dishonest in little things, you will be dishonest with great responsibilities. And if you are untrustworthy about worldly wealth, not that, worldly wealth, who will entrust you with true riches of heaven? And if you are not faithful with other people's things, who will trust you with things that are your own? That is scripture. That is Luke 16, verse 10 to 12. <laughs> so the language of stewardship in the Bible is very strong because it says that is God's way of checking whether you are wealth worthy. Hello? Are you wealth worthy? Can he entrust you with something that he can call you, you can, can be labeled by your name? based on the stewardship principle. And stewardship principle is a virtue. You have it or you don't. It says if you are faithful in little, we say tick, you are faithful in much. We do not say you will be, you are already, you have it. How many of you today, if your president calls you today and say, I want you to be in charge of a women's fund in this particular region or county or wherever, you say you are ready and you have track record. How many of us would like to kill Goliath? <laughs> Tell me which, which bear or even a, a cockroach or an antelope have you ever killed? Because Goliath, when, when, David, when David was coming to kill him, King Saul, his brother told him, no, no, don't even try to do such a big business. You're doing a business and you're asking, are doing a proposal for millions of dollars? Don't dare. Say, no, no, Your Excellency, let me correct you. I may be a small boy, but let me tell you what I've done. One day I was taking care of sheep. A bear came, I killed it. Another day I was killing, taking care of the sheep. A lion came, I killed it. That's my CV. Lest you forget. <laughs> so, this collab, I'll add it on my resume. How many of you want more funding? What did you do the last one you were given? That's why after that, David never worried about King Saul. You know why he never worried about King Saul? When I did years and years, imagine. This Goliath was the biggest problem of King Saul. And David killed him. Why would he now kill the person who was worried about the thing he killed? That's why he didn't even think it's worth it. If he killed Saul, even though he had chances, if he killed Saul, he would have diminished his value. Because he had already killed the bigger thing that was bothering this soul. Mm -hmm. I don't think you're getting the joke. Solve big problems. You do not worry about mediocre people around you. Thank you. So, stewardship. Proverbs 12, verse 27 says, A lazy hunter, think of this, a lazy hunter does not catch his prey, but a hardworking person becomes wealthy. You are a hunter, but you don't catch a prey. So why do we call you a hunter and you never caught a, a prey? Have you seen business people who have never done any business? Ask your sister. You are an entrepreneur. What have you ever enterprised in? <laughs> so, that's why the harsh word, the judgment of Paul, say conclude on stewardship in 2 Thessalonians 3.10. That must come to us as Africans. It says, if you are not willing to work, then if someone is not willing to work, then he is not worthy. He is not, he is not to eat either. That's Second Thessalonians 3.10. If you don't work, you don't eat. Do you know if you have a company of nine poor people, after some short while, you'll be the tenth one? Be careful. Especially in Africa civilization. <laughs> Hello? 
So if you have poor people around you, yeah. only wanting to eat but don't want to work, that's why Mahatma Gandhi said, among the seven deadly sins is wealth without work, worship without sacrifice, politics without principles, science without conscience. And I challenge us, especially here in Kenya, I don't know this in other countries. The other day I was talking to some parent and the son was very depressed. And when he asked the son, what is the problem, son? And the son told him, mommy, my business is doing badly. What business are you doing? Mommy, I bet you 2,000 and it's gone, it's gone. His business was betting. Because we have a culture that is now entertaining, greed. It's appealing for shortcuts. That's not kingdom, that's not theological. You are worth your work. So I conclude with the responsibility. So we talked about excellency, we talked about ownership, we talked about stewardship, and now I conclude with the responsibility. This is the summary of the whole, I would say largely, what the Bible is teaching about wealth creation, and in fact, I want us to for the sake of this discussion, right, for the sake of this discussion, I want us now to think beyond wealth creation. And let's think about wealth appropriation. Because we are appropriating it. It's already there. Does that make sense? The wealth is already there. How do we appropriate it? That's where our responsibility comes in. Luke 12, 48 says, therefore, from everyone to whom much has been given, much is to be required. How many of us think that we have too much wealth? Am I losing you? Have we not just agreed there is too much wealth? How many of you know that if you want one million now, you can get it? Just solve one problem a million times and you are paid one shilling every time you solve it, you'll be a millionaire. If you solve one problem a million times and you are paid one, one dollar every time you solve it, how much will you get? Because a million is there. How many of us pray and believe that God is sending the car to us now? He is not manufacturing the car. The car you're praying for now is already in a showroom somewhere. How do you get that car to you? All right? So entrepreneurship is your response. Let me say, responsibility has two words. Response plus ability. You got it? Response and ability. That means, one, that entrepreneurship is your response to your abilities. That's what it means. Every one of us here has skills, has talents, has gifts, has potential. How are you responding to them? That is called entrepreneurship. Ecclesiastes 9 says that whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your heart. That means be responsible. Don't give excuses. Thomas Jefferson was the third president of America. And he said, those who are good at excuses will never be good at anything else. Yeah. Have you had somebody giving an excuse until you say amen? <laughs> so convincing. But anytime you excuse yourself, you accuse yourself. Every time you excuse yourself, you? Because your excuse is somebody else's reason. What you're using as your excuse is the reason somebody is doing what you're, you're not doing. When I was in the slums, what others were using as excuse, I used it as my reason. What other women are using as their excuse must be your reason. Okay. Being a woman is not a liability, it's an asset. Okay, in the positive sense of that word. Okay? So I'll ask you to read Matthew 25, verse 12 to 30, please, in the interest of time, because it now shows us the summary of the Matthew 25, verse 14 to 30. It shows us the summary of the call to responsibility. Different talents. One was given five, one was given three, one was given one. Is that true? Yeah. Matthew 25, oh, sorry, one. Five, two, one. And know what the one did with the one that he was given. He did not respond to it. Suppose he responded to it. 
And so, I want to summarize by saying uh, the last passage I'd like us to read. That's in uh, Genesis chapter 1. So let's read chapter 2. Chapter, Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. That's the responsibility. This is the mandate of man. This is the mandate of wealth creation and entrepreneurship from the very beginning, from the mouth of God. So the Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. Chapter 1, verse 28. Then, then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful, multiply, replenish, subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the, everything that moves on the earth. Right? Verse 29. And God said, See. What did he say? Oh, talk to me. Thou shalt not wear the speaker. Thou shalt respond. What did he say? See. I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is in the face of the earth. So five things that have been done, then we can talk. There are five things. This is the curriculum of wealth creation. Are you ready for the biblical curriculum of wealth creation? The five things. And you know five in the Bible is a number of responsibility. You know that? <coughs> right? That's the five-fold ministry, talking about the responsibility of the church. That's why you have five fingers on both hands, limbs and toes, so that to the extent that you are all factors constant and you have your limbs and your fingers, you should be responsible. That's why you have five senses that you are responsible. That's why we have all those, all right? Now, number one, be fruitful. Number two, multiply. Number three, replenish. Number four, subdue. And number five, domin have dominion. Let's say them together. Be fruitful, multiply, replenish, subdue, have dominion. They are so easy. You need help to misunderstand them. They are so easy. Try it again with me. Be fruitful, multiply, replenish, subdue, have dominion. If you are going to have to do wealth appropriation. And if you are going to be an effective entrepreneur, the mind of God and throughout the scriptures is in these five things. Number one is what? Be fruitful. Be fruitful. In other words, be creative. Everything, every, you have the seed for every fruit you must produce. You have the seed. That's why you talk of seed money. So if you're given seed money and you're not fruitful, are you an entrepreneur? In the curriculum of God, you're filled already. And you can't even qualify to the next level. Because you cannot multiply if you are not fruitful. Hello? Multiply is like addition. Sorry, fruitful is like addition. Multiply is multiplication. It's geometry and arithmetic. Three plus three, uh -huh. Three times three? Nine. Which one is better? Plus or minus? Nine. Times. Nine. So if you are fruitful, you use the seed that you have. Use what you have to get what you don't have. Alright? And then, so that's in creativity. <laughs> then when you have fruit, you do the next thing. Multiply. So you multiply the fruit. How do you multiply the fruit? Innovation. So you just don't do what you did to be fruitful. Now you do 10 times rule. Now you become innovative. Now you don't think outside the box. You throw the box and think. You know, we keep being told, think out of the box. Why should we refract the box? Just throw the box and think. And become innovative. Hello? I'm moving fast. So when you're fruitful, you are creative. When you, are, when you multiply, you are innovative. Then replenish. Do you know what's replenish? Management. Replenish means, for example, you replenish your refrigerator. Is that true? When some relatives have passed through that fridge and things are depleted, what do you do? 
you restore it back to the normal state. In other words, that is called CSR. Show what aspect of your entrepreneurship is meeting a need in society. Replenish. Let your business be a source of refreshment. What gaps is your business filling? That is God's philosophy of replenish. Does that make sense? Yeah. I know you are taught in technical terms. Number three, and that's why it replenishes Deuteronomy 8.18. I give you the power to make wealth that you may establish my covenant. What was the covenant? Genesis 12.2. What was Genesis 12.2? I will bless you and you will be a blessing. Is that true? Yeah. Listen to me, my dear mothers and sisters. And that's you are not ready to be blessed if you are not ready to be a blessing. The motto of God, I will bless you and be a blessing. So if he blesses you and you are not blessing, you have shortchanged God. So the purpose of wealth is so that it can enhance the welfare of God's people. Number four, subdue. Subdue is administration. Subdue. Subdue means bring it under control for greater good. For example, if somebody attacked you with a knife, in military tactics, they say, can you subdue him? You handle him, put him down, and bring him under control enough for you to be safe. Is that true? <laughs> so subdue means what are things that are around you that are threatening your welfare, your family welfare, your society welfare, your nation's welfare? Your entrepreneurship should be that which is solving big problems for the benefit of your clients. was about number eight, number 18 in the list of things that are considered well. <laughs> Wisdom, fear of God, all those are considered top of money. Hello? Yeah. Money is our conspiracy of a paper which you say this is money. So we can kill each other because of a paper that you said is important. Hello? And the final one is 